Hello. And welcome to another episode of Earth 911's Sustainability in Your Ear. I'm your host, Mitch Radcliffe. Today's conversation is special. I'll be talking with a change maker who not only works to accelerate, but also helped launch the transition to a sustainable carbon neutral society in the 1970s. I've had the pleasure to get to know my guest today, Gil Friend, very well over the past year. He's the founder and CEO of Natural Logic, a sustainable business strategy consultancy, and Critical Path Capital, a private equity firm, as well as, I'm happy to say, a recent addition to Earth 911's Board of Advisors. Gil is also my friend. He's been working to increase awareness about the environmental damage created by our way of life and encourage government and business to take action for almost 50 years. In 2011, Gill was named to the first class of the International Society of Sustainability Professionals Sustainability Hall of Fame. So if you think about this as uh, comparable to baseball, we're talking to Ty Cobb or Babe Ruth today. During the 20 teens, Gill was the first chief sustainability officer for the city of Palo Alto, California. I've been participating in Gill's monthly Living Between Worlds conversation, a Zoom forum that he and Ken Homer created to connect concerned people to discuss the transition from a wasteful, extractive economy that created the climate crisis to a new, emerging, but still undefined society. We're living between worlds. Gill's an ideal leader for that conversation because he's helped to plumb the unexpected to pioneer ideas that we now take for granted from rooftop farms to agricultural policies that he developed while working for California Governor Jerry Brown during the 1980s. I could go on, and we'll include links to explore more about Gill in the article that accompanies this podcast, but let's get into it. To check out his history and natural logic, visit natlogic.com. Natlogic is one word, no space, no dash, natlogic.com. Welcome to the show, Gill. It's great to have you here. Glad to be here, Mitch. Well, you know, I want to start off. You've said that the engineer and futurist Buckminster Fuller changed your life in the 1970s with his world game. Mm -hmm. If you had an opportunity to speak to him today, what would you ask him based on everything that's transpired since he passed? Uh, I guess the first thing would be, what does it look like to him now, given his perspective? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, a half a century of work looking at global trends and technology trends and so forth. And we've seen in these last 50 years, an acceleration of everything, the good and the bad. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would ask him that. And um, that's it. And then I see where, where, where would the conversation go from there? You know, I, I heard him lecture once when I was in college, uh, which was astonishing because he, How many hours? about three and a half. That's just typical. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and the setting on the stage was as though we were in his office or laboratory. Mm -hmm. And he had stuff all over and he would just wander around and pick things up and start to talk and make a point. Talk a little about Bucky's worldview. How did it change your worldview? Well, I was I was probably, what, a year or so out of college, and I stumbled across uh, Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth. Actually, I stumbled across it through the good graces of the whole Earth catalog, which brought me many jewels in those yes. days. <clears throat> and um, I read the Operating Manual. Um, Despite the fact that it had sentences that went on for two pages, I found it the most lucid thing I'd ever read. Handed it to my roommate, Jesse, and said, you got to read this, Jesse. And he read it. He said, I can't understand a word of it. <laughs> so that was that was interesting in itself. Um, I uh, dug into his work, uh, found an astonishing collection of work that he had done with John McHale on, uh, on Global Trends. It was the publications of the Design Science Decade. Mm -hmm. uh, you can still find if you're if you dig deeply. Um, and so I called Southern Illinois University, where he was a scholar in residence at the time, to see if I could get a copy of these things. Mm -hmm. And they said, yeah, but you should also come out this summer because we're having a World Game workshop. Really? So, yeah. Um, uh, World Game was this idea that Bucky floated in the 1960s to saying, look, you know, we, we're, we're very good at war games where we bring, you know, armies bring together imaginary red teams and blue teams to fight simulated conflicts to see who could kill each other more effectively and conquer more territory and so forth. He said, what if we had a world game that was focused on how do we make the world work for 100% of humanity in the shortest possible time through spontaneous cooperation without ecological offense or the disadvantage of anybody and have the teams compete to see who can do that better. And he envisioned a whole kind of pre-cyber approach, uh, football football stadium, people in the stands with digital mm -hmm. controllers controlling 
uh, on the floor of the of the uh, on, on on the football field a uh, a giant map of the world filled with little tiny light bulbs that would animate um, graphs and trends. So, so it's yep. you know, way ahead of the technology. But the idea was to get into looking at that comprehensive whole system view of everything and all its interconnections and think about how do you make stuff work. Uh, so the world game in Carbondale, Illinois was a non-cyber version of that, but it was about mm -hmm. eight people from around the world working 80-hour weeks for a month looking at global issues and global trends, um, um, food and ag, energy, housing, healthcare, transportation, education, recreation, and on down the list. Uh, and uh, it did three profound things for me. One is it immersed me in a very different way of thinking, mm -hmm. of a whole, what we now call systems thinking, whole systems thinking, which was it was must have been intrinsic to me because because uh, I took to it like a duck to water, but I dove deep into that way of thinking, and that's carried me ever, ever since. Uh, second, it was very clear uh, from a deep dive into the data and analysis and simulation and so forth in every one of those domains. It was very clear that there was no necessary obstacle to human well-being on this planet. Yeah, yeah that's that's where people, came are, people aren't hungry because there's not enough food. People are not housed because it's not because there's not enough materials or buildings, et cetera. It's a matter of will and organization and so forth. And so that was that had been an intuition for me, but this made it very clear and grounded in every single one of those do domains that we looked at. Third is that uh, despite the global perspective, in Every domain, the solutions were local, small scale, adapted to place, not mega geoengineering. Mm -hmm. Really surprising. Uh, and that then led to my work in co-founding the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, which focused on ecologically grounded urban economic development in American cities, built in that, uh, built out of that tradition. Actually, the fourth thing that happened there is I met my wife and partner of the last 50 years, so that counts too. An important one for sure. Now so sustainability the idea has evolved out of that 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 soup of, it, of thought that you're talking about participating in how's your definition of sustainability changed over the decades as things accelerated in particular yeah good question um i think early on uh it was as well it was it was twofold early on one is as an environmentalist environmentalist looking for us to do less harm Mm -hmm. um, which was common, but it's a weak organizing principle. The second, which Bucky was actually very early on, and it wasn't carried, it wasn't talked about very much, but, you know, lately people talk a lot about, you know, not sustainability, but regeneration. Well, mm -hmm. he was talking, he and Bob Rodale were talking about regeneration in the 60s and 70s. And he talked about the regenerative capacity of Earth's living systems. So that's been a seed for me all the way through. Um, with the uh, Brundtland Commission, um, you know the the like the classic definition of uh, uh, um, meeting meeting today's needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill McDonough turns that on its head in a lovely way. He says, "Let's take care of future generations without compromising the ability of present generations to thrive." Uh, both of those imply some kind of limit or trade off. We're kind of breaking through the trade off and the. Um, regenerative story says let's not just be sustainable let's not just keep things from getting worse michael Braungart has this wonderful uh, 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 um, move that he makes he says if i were to ask you how your marriage is and you told me it's sustainable i'd feel sorry for you that's not aspirational of where we might go so so the notion of of, of restoration and regeneration have moved into the conversation over the last what five or ten years for me, the focus now is more this. It's how, is what might it be like if we did business and frankly, everything else as though we actually belonged to the living world and as though we belonged to each other. That's it. What would we be? What would we do? How would we live if, if that was our frame? Well, so that's where there's an interesting barrier to business adopting a sustainable mindset in my mind because they tend to think only in terms of a, a zero-sum game there are no trade-offs it's all about their profit first and foremost mm -hmm. and you've been involved in driving the discussion around business sustainability for for a long time yeah. how have you 
stayed motivated in the face of the glacial recognition, uh, pace of recognition, that business is accountable for more than its bottom line. Well, I don't take my I don't take my motivation from the pace. I take my motivation from what makes sense and what's possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fundamental provocation that I've brought over the past, what, 30 or 40 years is that there's no, that you don't have to choose between making money and making sense, which I think I cribbed yeah. from April 11th. Uh, you know, the assumption, um, uh, very deeply held assumption in the business culture is that it's either or, that you do good or you Correct. do well. That you, you know, you're going to make profit, it's at the expense of social benefit. If you're going to do social benefit, it's at the expense of profit. Uh, and we have said from the very beginning, it's not true. At least it's not necessarily true. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, being sustainable doesn't automatically make you profitable because you still need to be an outstanding business and do all the business things you know that you need to do and do them well. But looking at a business through a sustainability lens, which is to say grounded in the physical systems of the earth system, the resource systems that we live in, uh, mm -hmm. provides a view into a business and business operations and business opportunity that you literally cannot see in your financial statements. It's not there on the balance sheet. It's not there in the P&L. But when we look through the ecological lens and all the other business tools that we have to bring to bear, we find enormous value that gets unlocked. And what I mean by enormous is in the case of one of our clients, billions of dollars of value that they could not see. And this mm -hmm. is a great company. I'm not going to give the name. It's highly regarded, very respected in this industry. In fact, a sustainability leader. And yet, um, their value chain leaked. And we helped them identify where it was leaking and what they might do about it. And the, the value estimate was not ours. It was theirs. So, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, how do you... This this idea of trade offs and zero sum and and so forth is is endemic in business. How do you explain the benefits of operating sustainably to clients? And and you've worked with like Walla, HP, SunPower, Levi's, eBay, many others. Yeah. How do you start the the conversation about that abstract potential value mm -hmm. that you can unlock? Well, we started long ago by starting with the very concrete and with the operations more than the strategy. We'd say, mm -hmm. well, let's, let's look at how you're operating and look at where there is waste. Uh, waste can be material waste, which is where Earth 911 focuses. It could be energy waste. Um, it could be lost opportunity waste. It could be what my friend Chauncey Bell calls coordination waste. Mm -hmm. But where are things not happening according to plan? And we would start there. We developed what we called an eco audit, which was a comprehensive energy water materials assessment of a company's mm -hmm. operations to identify where there were things lost and where they could do better. One of the things we learned in the course of doing that is that the folks on the shop floor know an enormous amount about a company. Yeah. They know things that the suits never know. And sadly, they're rarely asked about what they know. And so we got very curious and would, you know, would not just walk through a plant with our, with our clipboards, but would talk to people and see what they saw and ask them questions they weren't getting asked. And so we would unlock gold bonds of opportunity. We started there. Well, you know, let's, let's cut costs and improve profit margins. Mm -hmm. That's very understandable to anybody. It's a no risk, high return operation. The, the conversation gradually broadened to look at, well, how are you running the company? Uh, what, what are you measuring? Led us to the development of the first sustainability dashboard in the mm -hmm. mid 1990s. Um, uh, and that starts to open up the questions of, well, okay, if all, you know, in a lot of cases, execs would say, or leaders would say, well, we know, we knew about these opportunities. Well, then the question is, well, why didn't you execute on it? And then we get into those questions. Then we gradually move into the questions of strategy. And, um, and I remember one day uh, with an executive biotech company um, asking her, well, what are you really here to do? And the room went quiet. And it was one of the, like the frame shift is like a rack focus in film, if you're familiar with the, with the image. Huh. Uh, and she, she was quiet for a long time. And I had the good sense for once to keep my mouth shut too. And not ask a follow-up question, but to just wait. And she said, finally, she said, well, what do you mean? You mean, do you mean in my job? Do you mean in my life? And you know the whole relationship and conversation shifted profoundly from there, and 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 embedded for me that 
maybe the most powerful question I could ask a company is, what business are you really in? Mm -hmm. What are you really here to do as a company? And the ready answer, if you ask, ask 10 people on the street, nine of them will say it's to maximize return to shareholders. But that's not the purpose of business. That's the result of a business doing its purpose well. You know, you go into work in the morning and you turn on the light switch and you don't think to yourself, my purpose today is to pay the utility company for the electrons. Mm -hmm. That's a cost of doing business. You need electricity to run your computers and your machines and so forth. It's not why you're there. You're there to do something. And you, one of the things you need to do is generate returns to your shareholders to pay them for the use of their capital. Absolutely. But I wonder, why do people think that's more important than paying the utility company for their electricity? Well, in part, it's a function of how we compartmentalize our life. And, and the, sure. the systemic view forces you to think beyond the barriers of the compartments. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that in my work with you, that's one of the most important insights that I've developed. Mm -hmm. as, as you look at the, the evolution of the conversation, including the conversation that is being used in marketing and communications, do you think that right now we're seeing real changes driven by a genuine concern about businesses' role in the, the living world, or is it related primarily to their concern about regulatory or consumer sentiment risk? It's, it's both. It's mm -hmm. both of those, and the mix varies with company and varies with individual. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you know, what is notable is that over time, we're seeing more of that first set. We're seeing more of the genuine concern, and that may be a generational shift. Uh, yeah, I believe so. a different cohort comes into leadership, people who are raised in a different time in a different era with different sensibilities. Uh, um, Michael Phillips used to say the most significant correlate of social change is generational shift. It's not that so much that people change minds, but that we change people in leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's part of it. I think part of it is 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 personal development and uh, and and shift in awareness of individual people. But we do see more leaders now who are motivated by general, genuine concern. And to add to your list of regulatory and consumer sentiment drivers, there's employee drivers. Yeah, Companies are finding more and more that, that the folks coming up want to work for companies that are doing the right thing and are less willing to work with companies who don't. Uh, and that's going to be an increasingly important force in the world. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, you can see this probably most profoundly in the oil industry where people are simply, some of them go in thinking, yeah, I could change that. And when they realize that they can't, they leave. Some leave, and, and, and that, some are hanging in there. I've got a, I've got a friend who is, who is specifically working with the energy transition in the oil industry. It's very challenging for her. Mm -hmm. um, but there is, you know, there is both a sentiment that you're talking about of people wanting to do the right thing. There's a recognition, of course, that the industry is in its last phase, uh, you know, some some decades longer. And, and even, you know, all, all the big folks know this, too. Uh, so, yeah. of course, is how do you transition? Do you, you know, do you extend the fossil fuel industry as long as possible? Uh, do you take your technology and move it into carbon capture, ca capture and storage or into hydrogen or other liquid fuels or other energy systems, uh, but there's a long distance between the talk and the do in that industry. Yeah. Gil, this is fascinating. We need to take a quick commercial break. We're going to be right back. We're back to continue the conversation with Gil Friend, CEO of Natural Logic and Critical Path Capital. Gil, you know, this is starting these conversations is always very challenging. I do it too in, in my work. What criteria do you suggest a business apply as the first steps in beginning to establish their sustainability strategy? What should they look at? Well, the first step right now, Mitch, for everybody is to think about carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. um, that's up and live for everyone. The concern about climate crisis, uh, you know, we, we don't need to go through the details of the unfolding news reports about Antarctic ice shelf and everything else. But that's number one. Everybody is going to be asked about that. Uh, it's 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 a broad enough issue that it affects everything a business does. So it's a fine place to start, mm -hmm. uh, but not only there. Um, um, before climate was the hot issue, <laughs> um, we would talk with companies a lot about waste in a very particular way. Um, uh, we'd ask companies about their non-product output, which is to mm -hmm. say, what are you making that you're not selling? 
um, you know, where, where Earth 911 is focused on, on waste and recycling, we would say, look, the, you know, recycling is great, but the waste that is being recycled is energy and resources and plant and equipment and labor and management time and enormous investment in resources that's adding no value. And this got brought home to me. Um, I think Paul Hawken first flagged me to it, the work of Robert Ayers, um, uh, who identified, look at the material flows of the U.S. economy. This is back in the 1980s, so the numbers are going to be slightly different now. Uh, but his assessment was that about 6% of the physical stuff that moves through the economy is product. And about 94% of it is what we call non-product. Yeah. And it's worse, because if you take that 6% and watch that over the next six months, 80% of that is on the trash heap. Mm -hmm. So the question for companies is, well, if you could just, if you could cut your non-product by 10%, not a big number, you've doubled your effective material output and potential profitability. So that's so that's the next question is what's your non-product output? And no one thinks about that um, uh, as, 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 as a framework and it's staggering for people when they begin to think about it. Um, third, I think is the question that I asked before, which is what business are you really in? Mm -hmm. What really is your purpose and the value you're attempting to generate in the world, and then compare what you're doing against that and see where do we line up and where do we not? Not as a not for self-flagellation purposes, but to say where are the opportunities that we might be missing in our single-minded focus on short-term quarterly returns and speaking to the street rather than think about what's the company trying to do. This this was really brought home to me, Mitch, by um, A.P. Giannini, who is the founder of the Bank of America. Mm -hmm became mm -hmm. the Bank of America 130, 40 years ago in San Francisco. And Giannini started a bank focused on the fact that uh, Italian immigrants in San Francisco couldn't get capital from the regular banks. So he created a bank to meet the needs of that immigrant community. And that, he said, was the purpose. And he said, if we do that well, we will make plenty of money. The purpose of the bank was not to maximize returns. Maximizing returns was the consequence of right. doing the purpose well. So that would be the third thing I'd ask people to watch. Well, and what we're really talking about in a way is all the unrealized brand value that you build up by doing all these things right uh, and focusing on that that role in the community rather than the the consequence of a successful participation in your community. And 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 where I see this turning upside down these days is is in greenwashing. A lot of companies don't, I mean, they're, they're making a, what they believe is a good faith effort, and they don't seem to recognize that they shift from trying to make that positive difference to simply exaggerating their accomplishments while they kick the can down the road. What are the questions that a business leader should ask herself to keep her focus on communicating real progress? Generate real progress. Okay, so how do you how do you how do you describe that in the context of that broad category of unrecognized value that AP Giannini identified in the in the Italian immigrant community? Well, well, you you tell the truth and you tell good stories. Yeah, you start there. Um, you 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 say you you do more and say less. In other words, you don't overstate what you've done. You say I've got mm -hmm. some noise coming. You want to stop for a minute? No, it's fine. It's fine. Okay. Um, it's the recycling pickup on Friday morning. Um, uh, uh, you 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 do more and say less. Um, you don't exaggerate what you've done. And one thing which I, I I I one thing which I've seen relatively few companies do, but we've encouraged is tell the truth about where you're headed, and mm -hmm. how you're getting there, and how well you're doing, and where you are not succeeding. Be transparent about your breakdowns. So they're inevitably there. This is not a straight path. Uh, and we're still learning how to do this. And so talk about the gaps. Talk about where you've where you've fallen short of your own expectations. Talk about what you've learned and how you're revising your game. And it was just to say, be real. Well, and I think that sharing that learning is also critical to our accelerating the overall progress of society. And, and, and a lot of brands are simply afraid to acknowledge they can't do something perfectly. And that's you know, part of a our business problem. culture where people get de decapitated if they fail. Mm -hmm. But in fact, you can't succeed at, at inventing something new unless you're willing to fail. As Thomas Edison showed uh, many times. Now, uh, when, when I was in high school, my dad showed me a memo he'd gotten from Ed Land um, uh, at Polaroid, mm -hmm. uh, 
which a brief one page memo that basically said to his staff, he said, if, if, if you are not failing regularly, I'm going to fire you. <laughs> Land recognized this, that an innovation company, which frankly, we're all in now, yeah. an innovation company can't succeed unless there's room for experimentation and failure and learning. Now, one of the one of the participants in this conversation is the customer, the consumers out there. What should they be asking of companies that they're doing business with? I'm answering slowly, Mitch, because it's it's going to be a really different question for different kinds of companies. Sure, uh, but basically, um, consumers going to ask, "Are you you know are you are you doing what you say? Mm -hmm. Does your product meet the claims that you're making for it?" Uh, does your act do your do your operations and activities in the world meet the claims you're making for that? Do you care about the things that I care about, which is something we see very commonly in the in, in the consumer world from the you know from the environmentalist to the evangelist? People are asking are looking for companies whose values align with their values. And the question there is, are you walking the talk? Mm -hmm. or specifically around climate and environmental issues is do you have goals? Are the goals uh, 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 do you have goals? Are the goals aggressive enough? Are you? Do you have plans in place to fulfill those goals? Are you on plan? What are you doing? How are you learning? Are you telling me the truth? Uh, are you um, are you doing what you need to do to get by, or are you leading us into a new future? That's a lot of questions. Nobody's asking all of those, but that's kind of a stack of questions that I hear people asking. And, and a lot of these questions are related to, or at least answering these questions for the customer are related to providing data that those customers may not necessarily have the sophistication to understand because they're not in the industry. They're just shopping. How would you suggest we change the educational system to catalyze the transformation that we need in society so that we do have these questions being asked in a, in a regular and constructive way? Well, there's a whole huge conversation there. <laughs> let's start by saying um, let, let's let's teach new, you know numeric literacy as well as text literacy. Mm -hmm. um, let's teach critical thinking. Let's let's teach you know systems view, which, as Bucky would point out, is not a big deal because that's where kids are to start with. We sort of train systems out of our our humans, uh, but let's nurture that all the way through. Uh, now, this is controversial because critical thinking is is anathema in certain subcultures. Yep. Uh, but it's what you know we're 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 in liminal times. We're in a world that's changing radically. Uh, we all know this in our guts. Some of some of us talk about it explicitly. It's the focus of our conversations in, in the living between world uh, monthly conversations that you've been participating in that I host. Um, um, we are moving into a world that's very different than the one we grew up in. That requires thinking skills and listening skills and a sensitivity to events and trends um, and, and, and a capacity to navigate in the face of uncertainty. It's no longer set a plan and go A, B, C, D, and you're done with the plan. Everything is in motion all the time. Uh, everyone knows this to some degree. It's for, for many of us, it's to be very unsettled in our lives because who knows what's mm -hmm. happening. For others of us, it's like, wow, this is an interesting game board. What can I do here? What you know, what moves can I make here when 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 the future is open? It's interesting to me that it, 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 we we kind of characterize people who can live successfully in that environment as having ADHD. But what it really re seems to communicate to me is that it's the fluidity of your ability to integrate information that allows you to better participate in the environment around you, and and we taught. I mean, I that, that they tried to beat that out of me in in, in high school. Yeah. We need to change that. Yeah, we need we need emotional flexibility mm -hmm. and emotional fortitude because the changes are not going to slow down. Yeah, uh, and we can individually and collectively either be you know freaked out and shut down by that, or say this is you know, I mean, if if if, if you're in a boat out on the water and a storm comes up, you don't get to say I'd rather not be here. You or as, as Thompson said, when the going gets weird, the weird go pro. <laughs> there you go. I, you know, that, so in a recent. Uh, first, first, time, Twitter, first time I've heard Hunter Thompson quoted in a business podcast in a really long time. <laughs> well, Hunter had, has relevance to this, this transition <laughs> uh, in so many ways. I, I, and I went pro as a weirdo for a long, a long time ago. So, you know. 
so we in a recent living between worlds uh, conversation we talked about how to cultivate hope and why it's useful what's your advice about the role of hope in conversation with business and and moving organizations off the dime i guess my advice mitch is is to not treat hope as a prediction mm -hmm. but to treat it as a commitment as an orientation, as a way to live in the world, uh, as a you know, hope is a recognition that there that we live in possibility. Um, but we tend to think hope as hope being dashed instead of hope leading to learning that leads to more hope. Well said. So Greta Thunberg recently told the New York Times that the world's getting grimmer every day, and I'm I, I want to ask you and this is presumptuous, what would you tell Greta were she to ask about the potential for change in her lifetime based on what you've experienced in yours? Boy, I, I don't think I would presume to tell Greta anything. That's why I point out it's presumptuous. But First, of all, first of, of all, because of who she is and what she's done. Second yeah. of all, because of her age and my age and me mm -hmm. thinking that I could tell, what is she now, 19? I think she might be 20 now. Yeah. 20. Uh, you know, for she just got her new book. She did, and I haven't read it yet. But for me to, you know, tell, talk to a twenty-year-old who I don't know well and presume to give them advice is crazy to begin with. Number one, well, number two, assuming she asked. Huh? But assuming she, she asked. Wow. Well, I'd want to open up a longer conversation with her and start with maybe why, you know, why do you see it that way? Mm -hmm. Which I understand, you know, the climate trends are not healthy. Uh, what do you what do you what do you see that's working? Mm -hmm. Where do you see positive trends and positive moods? Um, where what's feeding your imagination and your hope? You know, I, and the hope word I don't think I'd bring up with her early on. I think I'd want to have the conversation mature first before going there. Um, you know, to some extent, people are motivated by rage at the destruction. Yeah. That what's being done to the world around them. It's, you know, it's got to be very different for a 20 year old than for a 73 year old. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to live to see the worst of it. No, for that, you know, my nieces will, their kids will Greta and her kids will. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but you know, Fernando Flores said a very interesting thing, thing to me last year. I was talking about being angry about something. He said, you're not angry. I thought, what are you? I, well, now I'm angry. You tell me I'm not angry. How dare you tell me I'm not angry. He said, no, no, you're not angry. You're indignant. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, how interesting. Indignant, a violation of dignity, offended that the dignity of human beings and our potential is being violated. And it's it's a different mood and maybe a different energy than rage. Uh, it's, um, you think about Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. And the stance and quality of him and his speaking, you can hear the indignity in there as a kind of motivating force has a different quality than than rage and, and dr that? king consistently avoided demonizing the other side he beckoned the other side into a middle ground that live the, the world between the worlds that we're in right now i always felt when i particularly when i watched the um, um the speech on the steps of the lincoln memorial yeah. at the march on washington mm -hmm. uh nelson mandela another mm -hmm. Uh, enormous dignity, oh, 27 years in prison, befriended his guards, mm -hmm. was invited by the president of South Africa to come out of prison to the presidential palace to help resolve what the future of South Africa. I mean, incredible. So what is it, you know, and, and I'm not saying to people be like them, right. but pay attention to how they were. Mm -hmm. What's the be thing? yourself, but with dignity yourself but with dignity and dignity is a powerful thing so i think that would be part of the conversation with greta um you know it's uh i i i think we'd want to do a couple of rounds on the dance floor of the dance between optimism and pessimism mm -hmm. which in my experience is not the most useful conversation to have but it's where we dance a lot of the time yeah uh, and how do we look at the you know trends that are both good and bad um and look for where are their opportunities to start to steer them to both 
yes, reduce the bad, but also expand the good. Look, Paul Hawken did put out a book some years ago called Blessed Unrest. Mm -hmm. Among other things, was a catalog of thousands upon thousands of creative, innovative, on the ground efforts around the world. There's a there's a film version of it, and the credit the credit roll goes on for I don't know 10, 15 minutes of just scrolling lists of projects. Um, you don't see that in the mainstream media. No, it's not exciting for you know for for the eyeball sellers to cover. But there's an enormous amount of innovation in the world, and this has been a thread in my work since the days of Institute for Local Self-Reliance and at the Office of Appropriate Technology in Jerry Brown's governor's office, state of California, is one of the most important things we would ever do is collect and chronicle the innovations and say to people who think it's all crap, nothing's working, it's all going to hell, say, well, look, but what about this? Mm -hmm. What about this? And what about, and here's this thing like around the corner from you that you didn't even know about. Maybe go walk over there and have a look. Um, because that feeds a different kind of mood than if you just live in the headlines, or if you just watch the destructive trends. Absolutely. Not to deny them, not to pretend those are not happening. Let's be wide awake and realistic. Uh, but where do we put our juice? Mm -hmm. Well, that's that is a great question. Let me ask this: We often finish these conversations by asking guests to paint a picture of what it will be like in the mid twenty thirties. But let me, because you are on the board of advisors of Earth Nine One One now, what can Earth Nine One One do? To help the circular economy come to fruition, what what's your advice? I know you'll give me this offline too, but I'd love you to share this so that everybody can hold us accountable. Well, this is the trick question of the day, Mitch. Well, it wasn't at all leading up to this. <laughs> well, the you know the obvious answer to what Earth Nine One One should do is to do what it's doing, mm -hmm. uh, which is you know to tell stories um, of things that work, give examples provide tools, provide access to what to do. Uh, you know, very specifically in the case of Earth 911, what to recycle, how to recycle, where to recycle. Mm -hmm. it seems obvious, but it's not accessible, not, not information that's available to a lot of folks around the country. So that's good, that's good work. Um, 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 <clears throat> there may be something to do around tracking trends in a more visible mm -hmm way to show how things are working and how things are working in different places. Let me let me kind of go sideways here for a moment, because one, one of the reasons that we created the, the business metabolics dashboards in the 1990s is that we were <clears throat> we were working with Odwalla, the juice company. Mm -hmm. Many people know and love it. Um, um, deep purpose commitment in that company early on, um, uh, you know, a real dedication at every level to do the right thing as best as possible. And one of the things we we were looking at their operations and procedures, and one of the things we noticed uh, was that um, they had commitments like using only recycled content paper. This was you know this was a a, a cutting edge move in the in the nineteen nineties. We've come a long way since then, but that yeah. was a that was an important thing. Uh, and we asked them, how are you doing on that? And nobody knew. Nobody was tracking it. So we started to track it for them. We built charts. And it turned out that um, despite the commitment, 90% of the paper they were using was virgin, 10% was, you know, 10% recycled, and a little of it was 100% recycled. And we built a chart and showed it to the CEO. And he said, that's terrible. I'm going to go out and, you know, give every, you know, read everybody the riot act. I said, no, please don't do that. Let's just take this chart and put this on, on the desk of each of your buyers. Mm -hmm. He said, and, and, then he, and he said, well, then we'll you know, give them instruction. I said, no, no, give them no instruction. Just put the chart on their cubicle and update it periodically. And within a few months, with no program, no training, no incentives, no rewards, the trends completely reversed. 90% of the paper being bought was 100% recycled. Ten, you know, a few percent of it was 10% recycled, and hardly any was virgin, which happened because sometimes somebody needed something and they were in a hurry, they had to get something. But it became it in 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 a matter of months, it flipped from the rule to the exception simply by giving people visual feedback. Second part of that story. When I was chief sustainability officer for City of Palo Alto, we the city was tracking um, um recycling activity at different facilities and we dove specifically into the firehouses around the city and produced a chart about level of recycling in the different firehouses and the fire chief looked at it in an executive team meeting and said well wait a minute why are why are one and three so much better and seven and eight so much worse let me go talk to them 
<laughs> and you know, let me, let me go be their boss and tell them what to do. I said, no, 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 just share the charts with them. Because then what's going to happen is that the guys in station seven are going to say, what in the world's going on here? How come three is kicking our butts? Let's call them or let's invite them over for burgers or let's figure it out among ourselves. Clear information, clear feedback, timely and in context is probably the most powerful tool I've found in all this work. So well, I, a place where Earth 911 could play in an interesting way. That I, you know, that is, as you know, that the part of the plan that we're working on is how to, to, to provide this information, let people trust people to make the best choice because it's, they are going to shape it. We're going to give the information. We're not going to shape the future. And if, you know, and if folks in city A see that the trends in city B right next door to them are different, mm -hmm. they will start asking their city council some questions. Absolutely. Gil, this has been Fabulous. Thank you so much for spending time. How can our listeners contact you to discuss working on a business sustainability project or get involved in what you do? Um, the the easiest central point it, it right now is, is through Linktree. L-I-N-K-T-R point E-E slash GP friend. Uh, that'll give them pointers to my website, to my publications, to my coaching services, to the Living Between Worlds conversation that you talked about. Um, uh, sadly, our website has not been updated in too long. Uh, so this is probably the best reference access point, Linktree slash GP friend. Okay, well, we will share that link in the uh, article that goes with the podcast too. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. Real pleasure, Mitch. Great questions, great conversation. Thank you. We've been talking with Gil Friend. He's the CEO of Natural Logic and Critical Path Capital, as well as a member of the Board of Advisors at Earth 911, for which we are so blessed. You can learn more about Gil and his work at what uh, the link he shared, which is link, which is Linktree slash GP Friend. But Linktree is L I N K T R dot E E slash G P F R I E N D. Linktree slash Gil, GP friend. Gil's long view is so important uh, to my perspective as I think about how we are going to continue to evolve Earth 911. The long view, which can aggregate in the experience of older people, as I'm coming to learn as I age myself, is essential to understanding the potential for change. Gil pointed out that we live not just in different times, but that different people are entering leadership positions, and we welcome that. When we honor the young who bring the energy and the vibrant new insights that will potentially change things, we enable multi-generational dignity. There can be no talking down to people. We have to give them the best information available and let everyone make their best decision. The benefit of having deep trust in people, which is the very essence of democracy, is that it produces unexpected results. And there's, that's where the solutions to the climate crisis will emerge. We need to keep an eye out for positive change by asking for transparency and information, and then holding ourselves, our employers, our communities accountable for what they do and to your own values. Each of us will add to the conversation, and when we do that, we can get through this. Courageous and clear communications is necessary to establish a trusted relationship with customers if you run a company, and that's even the case in sustainability communications. So take the time to measure yourself and share that story with your customers. I hope you take a few minutes to share this conversation with Gil, with your friends, family, your neighbors, everyone you know. These ideas are so important, and you folks are the amplifiers that spread them so that we can create a world with less waste. Please let folks know that they can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Audible, or any of the other fine purveyors of podcast goodness that you prefer. We appreciate your support. I'm Mitch Ratcliffe. We're going to be back with another Innovator interview soon. In the meantime, take care of yourself, take care of one another, and let's all take care of this beautiful planet of ours. Have a green day. Um.